Here we're going to move on to our gifted and talented program review and task force update, Dr. Dupree. Yes, sir. We have a, a, a broad report this evening because we've invested a great deal of time with the task force over the past year on efforts to improve our gifted and talented programming, and we've also conducted a program evaluation. So we're going to update you on all of that this evening, and I'm going to, I think, Deanna, are you opening that? So I'm going to turn it over to our Chief Academic Officer, Deanna Saavedra. Thank you, Dr. Dupree, President Burdine, and members of the board. As Dr. Dupree indicated this, this evening, we're going to be providing you an update on our GT programming along with key findings associated with a program evaluation. Um, Alice Ledford will lead the presentation uh, associated with the program evaluation, followed by Stephanie Williams, who will <coughs> share specific program um, updates um, regarding service fidelity, student assessment, curriculum and instruction, professional learning, and family and community engagement. We'll close the presentation with Lori Westfall, who is our new GT director, and she'll provide next steps in terms of our GT programming. So I'm going to hand it over to Ms. Ledford. Thank you. Excuse me, technical difficulties. So good evening, trustees and Dr. Dupree. I'm going to provide you with an overview this evening of the GT program evaluation that was completed by Hanover Research. During the presentation, I'm going to review with you findings related to GT identification, perceived challenges of courses by students, choice in assignments and learning topics, student enjoyment of courses, and then Ms. Williams and Dr. Westfall will share with you how the information I provide to you this evening will be used moving forward. So with regard to the program evaluation methodology, Hanover used two methodologies to complete this evaluation. One, they looked at GT survey analytics, and then secondly, they evaluated GT data, which included demographic characteristics and academic performance of GT and non-GT students in second grade. The survey was completed by 7,326 GT and non-GT students in grades 3, 6, and 11. In terms of overall findings, with regard to GT identification, Hanover validated for us that certain groups in Fort Bend ISD are under-identified. And then later in our presentation today, you'll learn from Ms. Williams and Dr. Westfall how it is that we are going to address this concern. Regarding perceived challenges of courses between GT and non-GT students, the program evaluation revealed that GT students were less likely than their non-GT student peers to indicate that a course was too challenging. This was the, the case with all classes except for math, in which GT students were slightly more likely than non-GT students to indicate the pace of math was too fast. With regard to choice in assignments and learning topics, this was an area of note in the program evaluation as well. And Hanover, again, validated that currently for us, our student choice is limited. And Dr. Westfall is going to speak with us on how the district will be addressing choice moving forward. The program evaluation also revealed that course enjoyment was not really significantly different between our GT students and our non-GT students. So in summary, with regard to our program evaluation conducted by Hanover Research, they validated for us the concerns from the district perspective and has helped us by informing our next steps. And with this, I'm going to hand the presentation over to Ms. Williams. So good evening. As Dr. Ledford shared, the Hanover um, program evaluation provided information specifically around the identification of GT students, needs related to that and then instructionally around challenge, choice, and enjoyment of our GT students. So I'm gonna give you background now on the work that's been done and I'll hope to make some connections among the program evaluation, our initial steps, and the next steps that we have for 1920. So beginning in 2017-18, we launched a GT task force and I wanna take this opportunity to recognize members of the task force who are here with us this evening on the work that they've done around the planning framework and recommendations. At this time, would you please stand the GT task force. Thank you for being here tonight. As the GT task force engaged in learning, they identified best practices that would be part of our plan, which would represent goals. 
And then um, during the 1819 school year, the task force created task maps to detail actions for each of the next five years in order to meet those goals. Related to implementation, it was important that those goals align with the Texas State Gifted and Talented Plan. And um, on the next slide, I'll share with you the components. So the Texas State GT Plan outlines components that um, are part of an effective gifted and talented program for students. They are service fidelity, student assessment, particularly related to identification, curriculum and instruction supports, teacher professional learning, and family and community involvement. The next series of slides detail the initial actions that have been taken by the GT team in order to address each of these components. Related to service fidelity, last <coughs> year we adopted EHBB Local, which outlined changes in our gifted and talented program and the, the regulations for this policy have been developed and are imp being implemented in the 1920 school year. Part of those regulations define gifted and talented learning plans for each individual student which will also launch in the 1920 school year. In order to support the identified curriculum and program changes, we've made an adjustment to gifted and talented staffing, which includes the addition of Dr. Westfall, our gifted and talented director, and also the addition of a coordinator of curriculum integration to help with the enrichment experiences. Related to student assessment, as Dr. Ledford shared in the program evaluation, we have some work to do around identification specifically of underrepresented students. Last year, we administered in second grade to all students the COGAT in order to begin that pathway. This year, we are defining local norms, which are better described as criteria that can be used to increase the identification of gifted and talented students in those underrepresented areas. Related to curriculum and instruction, the Texas Performance Standards Project provides projects that are cross-curricular that can be used to address challenge, choice, <laughs> and student engagement of gifted and talented students. In the spring, in collaboration with the Teaching and Learning Division, those projects were aligned at grade levels because they come in grade bands like K-2. During the summer, we've been integrating those projects into the curriculum workbooks and they're ready for, um, they'll be the first phase of curriculum enrichment that our teachers have in order to support gifted and talented learners. We also made changes to professional learning in order to address and equip our teachers. As you know, all teachers participate in 14 hours of required professor, professional learning and teachers of gifted and talented students um, also do six hours of a GT update. This year, we required three of those hours be in district because we wanted to outline the new structure of GT programming and provide messaging related to the GT learning plans and the TS, TPSP <laughs> projects that are being integrated into the curriculum. In addition, because we know choice is important for our gifted and talented teachers, we hosted the Houston Co-op. There were 600 teachers, 350 of which were Fort Bend for them to be able to get their other three hours of the update where they had like a conference style and could choose according to alignment with the components that we've identified. Finally, related to the family and community involvement, um, I've already mentioned the work of the GT task force and that partnership that's been established in order to have an ongoing feedback loop to support the implementation of the task maps and the goals. But I also want to recognize the GT pa Parent Advisory Committee, which was launched in January and now has an executive board and will continue to be partnering with our team as we move forward. If there are members of that Parent Advisory Committee, could you please stand? <laughs> finally, related to family and community involvement, I want to highlight uh, one of the first actions that the GT PAC took, which was to host our first annual parent symposium. And the beauty of a parent symposium is that it's hosted by parents for parents, and so they're hearing from other parents who have students in similar need, and they're able to learn from each other. At this time, I want to, um, maybe this is your first introduction to Dr. Westfall, and I want to allow her to outline the work that will go forward in 1920 in order to achieve um, the goals that have been set. Um, as Ms. Williams has said, yes, this is probably my first formal introduction, although you've seen me on paper before now, I'm sure. And when we start looking at where we're going to be going for the 2019-20 school year, 
one of the first things we needed to kind of analyze is how we got to where we are now. And this is kind of our planning the work. We do have in place as of May five, a five-year task map that was designed by our task force. This outlines the steps that they actually went through. During the 2017-2018 school year, they worked on what we referred to as a GT framework. It was related to, at that time, the state plan in draft form. The draft has now become formal as of, I should know the date, um, as of July. It has now become formal. So our GT framework is what the task force began with. They looked at that and said, what really should be our key priorities as we go forward into our five years? And they identified key tasks that they really wanted us to begin working on. Once those key tasks were developed, they didn't just stay within the task force. They actually went back to all of their constituents, if you will, and asked for feedback. Do you believe that the direction that we're going and what our priorities might be, do you believe this reflects it? Based on that, the five-year task maps were developed. Those were formalized and accepted, if you will, through our task force in May. So in looking at our 2000, if you will, our 2019-2020 goals, this is just, by the way, reflecting the first step in our process of, a f in our first step, <coughs> excuse me, in a five-year process. So what you are seeing, what the Gift and Talented Department will do, plans to do for next school year. We plan to launch and support the GT learning plans. You've heard about that and we've had our training during the summer, so our teachers are ready to do that for the fall. We plan to establish our champions of gifted on each campus. That was a stipend position that was approved recently by the board that will be put into place and established. We plan to institute local norms, maintain our second grade COGAT testing as that's going to lead to equity when we look at our identification process. The integration of Texas Performance Standards Project in the Fort Bend ISD curriculum. We've began that process. We need to continue so that we know that it's being implemented in the classroom. We're going to pilot power hours to enhance student enrichment opportunities investigate and design our secondary GT curriculum, which is one of our needs. And then we plan to distribute monthly, monthly newsletters and promote monthly parent series in order to address our parent engagement. Now I know that these are just the first steps that we're looking for in a five-year plan, but everything is going to start with just one step moving forward to our ultimate goal, which would be alignment with the Texas State Plan in all areas that we've outlined today. And it's really exciting. This is not part of the script. I'm deviating. Um, it is really exciting to be part of a program that is going in the direction of true alignment. And from my personal perspective, I'm looking forward to that because it really will directly meet the needs of our gifted children. And that's, that's my whole reason for being in this particular position. Are there any questions? Mrs. James? Thank you very much for that uh, presentation and thank you for all the, uh, the uh, documentation you provided ahead of time and all the data and, and all that is very interesting. Um, I have a question if uh, you could clarify for us the term you're using, local norms. And uh, this is near and dear to our heart or my heart because we've in this boardroom talked many times about identification issues and, and how we're not identifying um, we're not identifying children um, equitably I'll put it that way so if you could explain local norms that sounds like what our we're doing in order to to uh, address that and I'd like to know more about it certainly the local norms that we are looking to implement actually come from the Hanover research report that was done as well in February where they went through and looked at where our children are scoring at the various different levels of socioeconomic, um, our different socioeconomic levels, I'm sorry, throughout the district. Based on this information, they have made a recommendation for numbers that we should look for to identify 5%, in the top 5% in each of our low SES schools. So that's gonna be based strictly then on the COGAT in second grade? It will be based, and what will happen is the COGAT is what we use as our initial screener. There's more as part of our identification process, but it's almost like opening the door. 
And if a child doesn't have a certain score, then the door isn't necessarily automatically opened. By looking at our top 5%, that opens the door to more children. It really will help address the opportunity for equity. And where does the piece, in the, in the past, there's been a history of um, teacher recommendations or parent recommendations and things like that. So will that still be part of the um, identification at these, under, at these um, higher socioeconomically disadvantaged campuses? Absolutely. Absolutely. The goal of these local norms is really to just open us up to more students, uh, more children. There's various different reasons why a parent or teacher may not see what they perceive as gifted that we see on a test. So by testing across the board in second grade, it offers a lot more opportunity. We might see more of those children that maybe the teachers aren't seeing or maybe the parents aren't realizing. Right, or something might show up in that test. So it's a little bit kind of how we're using the, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but it's a little bit like how we're using the uh, PSAT to identify AP potential in our eighth and ninth graders. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so that, then I also believe I read a little bit, and I know we've also discussed in this boardroom about identifying um, in different areas besides um, the academic core subjects. We talked about identification in leadership or in creative arts, fine arts areas. So is that, how does that fit into this? I didn't see it here. I didn't hear it if you said it in the, in the presentation. I, d I did not say it in the presentation, however, as I had mentioned, we have our five-year task map that directly aligns with the Texas State Plan. Both of those, and, and I hate to say it this way, but both of those are coming. We're doing a phase-in type of process. So we're looking at actually adding, as we did mention, we're looking at adding the enrichment piece as being our top priority for the 2019-2020, as well as our genius hour, that type of a piece. Following that, you'll hear us talking about adding some of the other identification processes. Okay, that's great. I'll look forward to that. And then I guess my other question, and I, uh, I saw in the plan that you had written um, uh, lots of goals and it's very complicated task maps and very, some of it was very granular and I tried to stay at 30,000 feet where my, where my job is. Um, but I was looking for something in, that was kind of milestones. You know, what are those milestones that are out there and is there certain percentages we're looking for? Are we doing this, you know, what's the timeline related? Do we have any information, is there any information in this report or that you have available um, that the board could sort of know what to expect? At the point where we are now, looking at May, it, and I'm not necessarily, you know, anyway, looking at May is when the document that you're seeing has been designed. One of our top priorities also, and you're right, it was not in our next steps, just because our next steps kind of focused on community and it focused on the state plan. But one of our other next step pieces for us personally within the department is to do exactly what you're asking. Just because we need to know if we've actually met the criteria. Uh, we need to know if we've met the milestone. And it's more than just a checkbox for us. Um, our department's incredibly passionate about making sure that what we're doing is the quality. So we are working on doing that and I'm reading my notes here. I'm probably not supposed to say that. We are going to provide <laughs> smart that. Smart, though. Smart to stay on the <laughs> right? script. Um, but no, that's one of my top priorities over the summer is making these a little bit more measurable. Uh, what can we see for that? So yeah. that will be something that we will provide in the future. Well, the board really likes things that are measurable because then we can see what impact. Check it off. Absolutely. Yeah, and, 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 but again, it's not so much also about checking it out off because <laughs> it's a... Um, an environment of continuous improvement. So we're always looking for uh, getting better and and really what it boils down to is serving the children. And we, I, I feel strongly that we are not identifying some children and that s children's meed needs are not being met. And so I'm anxious for us to to seek those kids out and to, and to help them and help their families because I can, tell you just in my own narrow experience, uh, you know, in one or two feeder patterns in this district of children whose needs were not being met, um, whether they were identified gifted and talented or they refused to be tested and so they were not identified or whatever it might be. And, you know, some of those kids dropped out of high school. So mm -hmm. the, I, I the situation, I'm just, 
expressing the situation is urgent because every year that passes we have a new crop of kids that come that comes through and we need to find those kids and we need to help them and get them the services that they need so thanks for working on it of course thank you thank you very much mrs james mr rice yes i was just going to ask if we're going to continue the gifted and talented parent advisory input is that going to be continue throughout the year um yes in fact well we have our GT task force. They're the ones who worked on our five-year plan. They will be working with us as well at least the next school year, if not more than that, just because they understand the five-year plans incredibly well. So they will provide good feedback for us as we start working on our milestones of what that might look like. The GT pack itself has just been developed. We have our bylaws. We have our executive board. That's hopefully going to be around for much longer. Uh, just because those are going to be some of our key people when we look at our family and community involvement. So when you say much longer, it should be, sorry. It should be around long as long as we long have term. the G&T long term. Long term, yes. and they'll be meeting monthly. All right. Yes, sir. All right. <laughs> it's a permanent fixture for our department. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Mr. Rosenthal. <coughs> so to follow up on that, will, will either of those – um, committees <coughs> um, ever get to discuss uh, their work directly with the board because I think that would be interesting to hear from time to time that's certainly something that we could entertain and so I yeah I, I, I like the idea of, of, of those committees uh, because they're on the ground and I think they'd be the first ones to know what's working and what's not um, and I think that's why that would be important for us to hear that that feedback mm -hmm. uh, whether either directly in this room or via some kind of report or something mm -hmm. so um, my biggest concern with with um, implementing this obviously it needs to be implemented uh, is uh, making it as easy as possible for our teachers because from my, my big one-year experience, you know, I had a couple classes with GT kids, and uh, that was tough, trying to create things that were different, that were, you know, you get trying to give them choices. We tried. It wasn't always doable. Um, but to me, that's where we really need to have a lot of support uh, because um, they're the ones in there, and, you know, it's already a tough job, and now – <coughs> you're making we're having to make sure that that they do the right thing and so they need the help they need that support and so you know you had mentioned that you know we have um, um, where was it a coordinator uh, champions of gifted services so are they at each campus they are each campus did okay. identify okay good all right okay that's all thank you thank you mr. Rosenthal mrs. Tossan did you have any questions or comments Yes, thank you, Mr. Burdine. Um, I want to start by agreeing with Mr. Rosenthal and reminding um, everyone that we have talked in the past about using Schoology for modifications and suggestions of uh, assignments for our special education kids as well as our kids who are identified gifted and talented. So. I just wanted to remind us that we've had these conversations in the past. I agree with Mr. Rosenthal. We need to do all we can to support our teachers in this effort. And now that we have the Schoology platform, I think we have a really good way to do that um, by posting, whether it's videos or suggestions or suggested ways to modify work for kids, kids who are identified gifted. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there at the outset. Um, I also agree with Mr. Rosenthal. I, I want to thank the administration for continuing the task force. I think it's something that the board thought was important and um, for also creating the parent advisory council. Um, having been at the beginning of the special education parent advisory committee, I think um, it's going to be really important for us to, um, I agree with Mr. Rosenthal. I think we need to hear from them uh, as a board member. I, I want to hear from the GT Parent Advisory Committee. I want to hear from the Special Ed Parent Advisory Committee members. Um, I think it's, we've, uh, I've seen the Special Education Advisory Committee 
evolve um, to where they are used more effectively. Um, I, I think we need to make sure that we're utilizing these committees in a meaningful way. And um, the only way we can do that is if we get input from them uh, for what should be on agendas or what should be discussed or what they think is critical uh, or is a priority. So I just um, would like for us as a district to keep that in mind as I've seen the special education committee evolve. Um, you know, they've now got some officers elected and the parents who are really involved are bringing things to the district. Um, and I, I think that that's a meaningful way to use these committees. And as a board member, I would like to hear from them. Um, so I, I'm going to second that, um, Mr. Rosenthal. Um, I also want to say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a parent of a, of a child who's in special education and a parent of a child who's identified gifted. So I just want to remind us that, uh, you know, I read the, the evaluation, not all gifted students are overachievers. Um, and I just want to, I, every time we talk about DT, I, I remind us of this, that some kids are gifted and do not do well in a classroom setting. Um, and I think that's part of why we're seeing the kids come back and say math is really challenging. Um, they're using a lot of worksheets in the math classes. There's not a lot of creativity. And by and large, our gifted students are creative thinkers. Um, I've got one in my house. Ironically, she didn't test gifted in the subject where she really is most gifted because we, like Mrs. James said, we just stopped testing. Um, so I just want us to remember that when we talk about gifted students, we're talking about the way kids process and think and learn. And I know you guys know that, but I don't want us to always think gifted students are, we're gonna see them as overachievers in the classroom. Um, we have a lot of gifted students who, when we get to the middle and high school um, areas, they're, in the, they're taking the pre-AP classes and the AP classes because that's really all that's offered to them as an identified gifted student. And that doesn't mean that they're going to be overachievers in those classrooms. If we're not meeting their needs and accommodating and modifying for them in ways that are meaningful and that meet them in the way that they process then we're, we're going to be spinning our wheels for nothing. So I just wanted to say that again because I, I, I do try to remind us every time that it's, um, they're not always, you know, overachievers. And GT kids don't always test well either. So I'm glad that we have the task force and the parents, and I think it's going to be important that we not only listen to our parents, but that we listen to our teachers who are telling us this kid thinks differently or processes differently or thinks outside of the box. Um, and then I, I'll go back to what Mrs. James said. I want to agree with her that I think our goals have to be measurable. I don't know how we as, as a board, as a governing body can know if we're progressing, if we don't have things in front of us that are measurable. Um, so I just want to reiterate that. I mean, GT has been placed on the back burner really for too long, and it's time that we start seriously making progress for our kids. Um, so I would like to see measures in place and see some milestones when we plan to be reaching those, those goals as well. Um, I'd also like to agree with her on the fine arts creative piece of it because you know, sometimes our gifted kids, um, it's not math, science, social studies. They're creative. They're creative thinkers, as we know. Um, I personally um, have thought quite a bit about our kids who are creative and who go the fine arts route, and they're taking those fine arts courses, but we're not giving them credit for them like we are the AP and pre-AP courses. I have a real problem with that. I have a real problem with that as a board member. I have a real problem with that as a mom. As a mom. Um, you know, I, I have one right now who's taking three fine art classes, um, and it's because that's where she is gifted. So I think we need to maybe rethink um, the credit that we're giving our students, especially those creative minds and those creative 
uh, kids who, should, who put in as many or more hours um, as the academic classes. And we've got to recognize that, um, that, you know, those students have a future in those areas and we've got to help facilitate and support that um, in, in the classroom in our schools. Um, I, I want to thank the administration for going through the evaluation. I want to thank you guys for all the hard work. Um, I, I want to reiterate that in the middle and high school level, we're not there. Um, we're not, uh, I, I'm, we're, I'm seeing more in Thornton now because we've got a new school and a new principal and we're doing kind of some new and innovative things there, but I know it's not in our other secondary schools. Uh, so I look forward to seeing, you know, how we continue implementing there and making sure that we have some milestones in place uh, for those students. Um, and that's really, my, most of mine were comment, more comments than questions, and I just wanted to really um, stand with my colleagues on some of the things that they said. So thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Tossan. Mr. Rosenthal. Yeah, I have a couple of follow-ups. So <clears throat> uh, Ms. Tossan, that, uh, I, I actually was going to ask about what, what the rationale was for GT students um, seeing math as more challenging, and I think you provided probably a good explanation. Uh, is that, would you agree with that? Specifically in the report, they mentioned the pacing of mathematics more than they mentioned what's right. going on in the mathematics classroom. Therefore, I would attribute that to where most students enter those mathematics courses in middle school where we're doing a year and a half of content in the course in order to advance them to algebra. And so the specifics of the report detailed the pacing okay. more so than the learning experiences, though I know that the learning experiences can always improve. Okay. And then... Um, <clears throat> I also found it interesting in the report about the, you know, you spoke a lot about high achievers versus GT, and um, there was a 27% number in there somewhere. Uh, I think it was uh, the group, may have been, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it sounded like they, it was 27% of, of uh, you know what, it's probably the Asian population, and it talked about receiving GT services. Was that did I read that correctly, or was that <coughs> were they identified? Yeah, I don't. I don't remember. I would have to go back and look at the report okay. to find that specific statistic and get okay. back to you. Because that's not. I mean, tell me again. It's like eight to ten percent of of the population is typically GT. Is that correct? Somewhere in there. Um, statistically speaking, it's around five to six percent. Okay. If you look at a bell curve of the nationwide, it's 2.5 percent, but okay. most districts identify five to six percent. Because that's I, I had always thought it was much lower, and then I, I brought that up probably a year or so ago when we talked about this, and somebody said no, it's higher than that. So that's okay. So <clears throat> I think we need to make sure that that parents really need to understand. Okay, your kid may be a high achiever, but that doesn't mean that they're GT. So I think there needs to be. And I talked about this last time we, we had this conversation. W there needs to be some learning and, and that, that happens, you know, in the community, on the, in, in the parent realm. So, and then just so you hear it a third time, uh, I also agree that um, there, there does need to be some measurables in this plan. And um, I would love it if you would take that back, that message back to the GT task force and just try to brainstorm, you know, what, what could we expect to see or what might we expect to see or what might be a goal in year one, what might be a goal for year two. Um, and and it, it, it may change a little bit as, as things develop, but I think there should be initial, some initial measurements. So I think that's really important. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rosenthal. I just had a, f a few really quick questions here before we move on um, about the professional learning involved. So if I heard that correctly, it was on slide 23, um, our teachers have 14 hours of um, mandatory professional learning, is that correct? Okay. And then on top of that, they have a six hour GT update, which did I hear you say three of that is done in, in district and three of those hours are done out of district? So every year there is a six hour compliance-based GT update, and that is in addition to the 14 hours. 
This year, we included three of those hours in district because we wanted a common message around the changes to GT programming. This is the first year that we've put that parameter on the update. Okay. As Mr. Rosenthal had stated, uh, and Mrs. Tossan alluded to this as well, but in my very limited experience in the classroom, professional development, in my opinion, is going to be the key to following through with what it is that we're doing here. So I really like the idea of seeing how others do it, good or bad, in other districts. So I think that we need to continue to keep that, um, which is huge. Do we plan on hosting the co-op in the future as well? This is our second year, and we will continue. Okay, that's huge. And then I think that I heard um, the board say that we have to have some measurables. And um, I also heard that we would like to hear from the GT task force and have some updates on that. So I think that those are very two, two very important items. And I want to thank you for the presentation and thank you for all your hard work and your leadership. And um, uh, Mrs. Westfall, um, can, Dr. Westfall, excuse me, um, welcome. So it's nice to see a, um, a name or a face to a name. So thank you for being here.